Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And welcome to another in our series of Tech Thursdays, where we approach topics in emerging technologies intended for a, an intelligent lay audience. If you're interested in a subject, you've heard about a, a, a technical topic area, if you want to learn more about it, this series is for you. Um, thank you all, first of all, to thank you to all of our attendees for your support of NDIA and ETI in this series. And especially thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is part of our Tech Thursday series, where we distill complex technologies into introductory webinars, uh, focusing on the, sci on, on the science and technology of various uh, defense subjects with important implications for national security. Um, let me offer some administrative remarks before we get started. First, um, all of our attendees are muted. Uh, if you have a question during the webinar, you can submit your question in the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. We will do our best to get through all the questions during question and answer period. No guarantees, but we certainly will try. Um, we are recording today's webinar for NDIA, WID, and NTSA members who are unable to attend, or maybe if you listen to the seminar and you want to review, uh, uh, review the seminar at a later date. Um, for any member who wishes to review the material, uh, it will be available uh, on our website. Within the next few days, we'll be posting that recording uh, along with slides and answers to the question and answer session. Uh, it'll be on NDIA Connect for your review. Uh, please remember, as always, the goal here is to educate our NDIA members and to introduce new topics. We're not trying to sell any programs, policies, or company products. That's, that's not our goal. This is purely educational. With that, let me uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Yadu Zambre. Uh, Yadu, thank you so much for joining us. Yadu is currently the Chief Microelectronics Technology Officer for the Air Force Research Laboratory, AFRL, of course, where he's responsible for defining microelectronics strategy and, and driving research and development efforts in coordination with colleagues in Navy, Army, OSD, and of course, other partners across the Department of Defense. Uh, Dr. Zambre holds bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering and applied science from Yale University and a PhD in applied physics from Stanford University. Um, he joined AFRL in late 2020 after a, a long and distinguished career at Lockheed Martin, where he was a senior fellow and served as a director for New Ventures, chief scientist for Space Systems Advanced Technology Center, and the chief scientist for information systems and global solutions, often working across the corporation to develop technology strategy, refine engineering practices, and resolve critical issues on major programs, including the F-35. And most recently, Dr. Zombri worked with external partners to create, incubate, and raise private equity for several commercial technology startups. Uh, prior to joining Lockheed, uh, Dr. Zombri held leadership positions in venture capital, management consulting, small businesses, worked with smart startup companies, where he developed and deployed some first-of-kind large-scale transaction systems, the automated speech recognition systems, and information security architectures and systems for global 500 companies. And earlier in his career, he was a research scientist at SRI International. We developed and fielded remote sensing systems, distributed network applications, and intelligence systems. Finally, Dr. Zombri recently finished a four-year term on the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, where he chaired the FY2020 study entitled Air Force Communications in Future Operating Environments. He was the vice chair for an FY2018 study titled Technologies for Resilient Command and Control, and served as a panel member on several other studies. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Zombri, Yaru, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, let's get to the charts. I'm assuming everybody can see them. Um, as Mark said, I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, at fairly tutorial level, what's going on with the electronics part shortage and its implications. So let's go to the next chart, chart number two. Um, so one of the key things to note is electronics, and everybody knows this, it's fairly prevalent across all of our daily lives. So you look at commercial sector, everything from cell phones to standard PCs, which are the, the biggest markets out there, uh, followed by automotive, uh, that's, that's growing fairly quickly. Um, and you got tablets, Game Boys, uh, Game Stations, things like that. Um, and the key thing is that that market, at least in 2017, was something on the order of uh, $300 billion. And it's, it's grown since then. Uh, out of that market, the government market, the military market, is uh, less than 1% of that and will probably continue to shrink from a relative perspective. So let's go to the next chart, chart number three. One thing to, to note is in addition to the different applications, on this chart, 
uh, is straight out of the uh, Hoffman Consulting Group and Semiconductor Industry Association uh, report that was published uh, uh, last year. You see the, the major applications down at the bottom. And in this particular chart, they break it up into three different categories of electronics. You have memory, you have logic, then you've got the, uh, the screen analog and optoelectronics and, and sensors. Uh, so macroscopically, what you see is the different applications use different types of electronics. And that's very, very important to kind of note. Uh, there's no one type of electronic. There's, there's really different flavors. And all of these categories are needed to enable all the applications we've got. Let's go to the, uh, the next chart. And this chart, same, out of the same report, basically shows that those different categories of electronics you see on the right, the, the, the memory logic and the other categories, um, really are produced on different, uh, uh, different node sizes in a semiconductor. So, um, so out at the far left is the 10 nanometer. Most of that's really used for, uh, for things like memory. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, logic. Um, when you get to memory, it's, it's the dark blue. You see the 79% at 10 to 22 nanometer. And the scale on the bottom is really how large the transistors are or the, how large the feature sizes are. And one tends to think nowadays that the 10 nanometer, nowadays 5 and below, are the, the more state-of-art foundries. At least that's the way a lot of people think about it. And that's not entirely true. There's state-of-art in each of the categories there. Uh, discrete analog, for instance, tends to be larger feature sizes just because they need to. Um, the key thing here is when you look at manufacturing, you need different uh, nodes or different manufacturing capabilities at different feature sizes. And we need actually the state-of-art, state-of-practice, and legacy. They're all needed. That's what we're, uh, later on we'll see how, how that really is impacting our, our industries today. Let's go to the chart five, next chart. This chart basically shows the different types of semiconductor wafers and materials. So the original wafer sizes, you know, were down well below, you know, um, a few inches, down 23 mam uh, uh, millimeters back in 1960s. Those are the small ones. And now uh, most Manufacturing is done on 300 millimeter or 200 millimeter wafers. That's just simply the radius of the silicon wafer you see. Uh, you see the picture on the left, uh, different sizes. Uh, equally important is different electronics will oftentimes require different materials. So it's not all silicon. Uh, there's different variants of silicon, silicon carbide, silicon on insulator, and so forth. And then there's the sort of combinations of compounds. So they're oftentimes called 3,5 compounds, things like gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, aluminum nitride. And the more exotic materials going forward are things like graphene and diamond, uh, which we're just sort of getting into. With the manufacturing shortages, there's been talk about going to 400 millimeters for quite some time. Bigger wafers mean more productivity. But that would mean uh, more equipment or different equipment will be required. So a key thing here is to note that the different semiconductor foundries are, are actually built to process different wafer sizes and, in some cases, different materials. So let's go to the next chart, uh, chart six. What you see here is a table of uh, very high level. Um, we're constantly updating this because things are changing all the time. But when you look at the different categories, so we've expanded out here beyond the three that you saw in the previous charts. So memory logic. ADC is, means analog to digital converter. There's RF analog. Uh, and in the ADC category, we also go the other way, digital to analog as well. Focal plane arrays are the things in your cameras. The, uh, the thing, basically the pixel array that detects uh, the, the images that you see. Uh, photonics is literally that, is uh, optical type electronics. Uh, RF power is what you see, the big power amplifiers, not even big. Uh, power amplifiers in your cell phones, and then DC power, things that do switching of high power. Sometimes it's, it's kilovolt type electronics, or electricity rather. Uh, sometimes it's just high power in terms of the amount of wattage that's involved. What you see on this chart is there's different materials for the primary process. Sometimes there's alternates. Uh, some of these will also drive different feature size, uh, wafer size, like I said before. 
the key thing to take away here is each of these particular processes has its own sort of pseudo supply chain. So there's no one supply chain in the industry. There's actually there's actually many, which tends to complicate things. Uh, so it's really more of a supply web. All right, let's go to the next chart. This would be uh, chart number seven. And to kind of illustrate the point, when you like a when you take an iPhone 11 and Similar breakdowns have been done with the more recent iPhones. Uh, this was just convenient to get. There's something on the order of 50 parts in an iPhone 11. And they're all at different feature sizes. They all come from different companies in many cases. And 85% of those chips, at least by number, are uh, 40 nanometer or larger. So not necessarily considered state of art from a foundry or factory perspective. 15% are smaller. So see kind of how it starts to break out. Key thing is that iPhone 11, in terms of full functionality, doesn't work without all those parts working together. And uh, there's no single vendor that dominates that, uh, any of those supply chains. So let's go to the next chart, chart eight. So this chart is kind of designed to kind of illustrate you know, how a, a particular electronic part it's manufactured. Everything from the, everything from the raw materials then uh, gets generated into wafers to the front end fabrication. Um, and then you've got the design piece, there's people designing things, um, back end assembly, and then the electronic manufact product manufacturing, and then eventually the sales process. When you look at the left picture, I've sort of uh, diagrammed it out of flowchart. In order to do design, you got you have to have people. So the expertise is very important. And in the commercial sector, there's these things called IP cores. Think of those as pieces of electronics that have already been designed and tested from a long time ago. I'm now integrating those things together into a bigger design, possibly adding in my own design stuff as well. And then in order to do those, use those tools, you need to have uh, EDA tools, electronic design automation tools. So these are the things that allow you to model, simulate, um, kind of like much like software, actually write your uh, write your your code, your DHDL or RTL code. And once the design is sort of uh, matured to some degree and appropriately modeled and simulated, you can then go to fabrication. You have to I've skipped a few steps in there. I need to create a mask, a photo mask. And I go to the factory and uh, basically with the mask, and they, they can then run the, uh, run the wafers through. Key thing there is I have to have materials, so that's wafers. And uh, in many cases, specialty gases. Uh, there may be some rare earth materials, some etching compounds, um, photoresist. All that stuff is critical to the operation of a factory. I also need to have the equipment. So everything from uh, metrology equipment to photolithography equipment, um, all, all that stuff's incredibly important for the fact of the foundry to actually operate properly. Once I have my wafers, I need to go to assembly tests and packaging. And that, that's a step where the wafer is diced um, and it's oftentimes done, sometimes done co-located with the foundry sometimes and outsourced firms. That itself, that operation needs equipment and different type of materials. So you can see, this is a fairly simplified view of the supply chain uh, for a particular wafer size and a particular set of materials, um, a, a particular type of ca uh, category of electronics as it goes through. And as you can see on the picture on the right, um, most of these supply chains are, are very global. Let's go to the next chart, chart number nine. Um, this is a, uh, a chart out of, out of that same Boston Consulting Group in Semiconductor Industry Association analysis. And the key thing they note is a given product within one, one of those supply chains can travel 20, more than 20,000 miles and cross a large number of international borders. And you know, the, the individual Supply chains span a lot of countries uh, to do wafer fabrication, equipment, wafer design. Every one of those um, is a fairly global supply chain. Let's go 
the next chart, chart number 10. Now, the key thing to note here, um, again, uh, the same report, is that different regions of the world dominate different parts of each supply chain. So design is something where, and, and the EDA tools as well, has been something where the U.S. and South Korea has been fairly forward-leaning. Um, and I think dominates with a good deal of IP also being developed uh, from a design perspective um, in, in Germany and India. So you have design and then you have the EDA tools and the core IP on the far left. That's dominated by a few countries. And when you get to the wafer fabrication itself, then you've got places like Japan, um, Taiwan, Korea uh, start to enter the mix. Um, very, very heavily concentrated, obviously, in, in Asia. The equipment and tools to do fa fabrication uh, is basically um, the, the EU, Japan, and, and the U.S. And materials, as you can see, things like photoresist, photomass, silicon wafers, the specialty gases, is yet a different set of companies, uh, basically Taiwan, Japan, and the EU. The back end assembly and test, um, Things like packaging, um, dicing, that, that's all uh, China, Taiwan, and, uh, and South Korea. So when you start to look at it that way, there's a certain amount of fragility in the supply chain with regards to global dynamics. That's something to keep in mind at all times. Let's go to the next chart. That would be chart 11. This uh, is intended to be sort of notional, but uh, it's based on a McKinsey analysis that they did um, on foundry economics. So key thing here is to note that foundries or, or, or wafer fabrication is a capital intensive business. For an advanced node, this, I believe this data was for a five nanometer node. Uh, that, say, depending on who you talk to, it's five to $20 billion of capital that's required to uh, to build the plant in the first place. Now, it may take five plus years, up to five years, to build a plant, and you don't see any revenues as a foundry operator until that plant is operational and you've got your customers online. So the point there is there's a long payback period. There's a high amount of risk. And for a firm to actually develop a foundry like this and uh, make money off of it, investors need to see some kind of return that you know that justifies their risk, which means that the fab utilization, what percentage of the time I'm actually serving a customer, has to be fairly high. And uh, what you see there is is a set of curves that show if we had no government subsidies, then it's uh, it's between five and six years of operation at full utilization. To actually get for the investors to get their money back before they make a profit. So a lot of firms are hesitant to commit capital for more capacity, whether it's new capacity or extension of existing capacity, because they, they need to see a real strong demand signal uh, going forward, and they need to see that that demand is going to be stable. So that's, that's the, sort of the, the risk calculation these guys are doing. The other thing that's happened is they tend to get into very lean, efficient, just-in-time operations. That means they're going to have a strong preference for large orders um, and very stable orders, so long-term contracts. So they want to minimize risk. Uh, they want to minimize their working capital and, and also inventory. That's actually what's happened across the ten, past 10 plus years is that uh, the supply chains have gotten extremely lean and at the expense of some brittleness. So any kind of disruption uh, tends to really, really have a devastating effect. Um, in addition to that, it's not as simple for, a, say, a, a device producer uh, to switch fabs, to switch foundries. To go from, let's say, TSM to, Sam to Samsung or to Intel. Um, because the yields are different, the, the different, uh, the PDKs is the process design kit, um, those are the types of transistors and the circuits that are built in as libraries into those fabs. They're different, and 
the tooling uh, sometimes changes as well. So the foundry economics basically drives firms to uh, to really be very risk averse and have driven them that way. Um, and there's been a, high, a huge dependence on sort of the global the global nature to uh, to make that more efficient. Transportation has always been fairly cheap uh, until now. Go to chart number twelve. Next chart. So this is this data is from a Department of Commerce survey of the semiconductor supply chain. Um, so at a macroscopic level, the, the supply chain shortages have been in the medical broadband and automotive markets. That's where we, uh, from the newspaper perspective, we see the biggest issues, as well as from the uh, the individual uh, companies, the markets. We have insufficient fabrication capability, primarily for the microcontrollers, analog chips, optoelectronics chips, and in the auto industry, some power chips. Um, the key thing to note here is these are all older nodes. These are technology nodes uh, for manufacturing that were built some years ago. They're not the new ones. We, we do have a shortage of new parts as well. Um, there's also insufficient assembly test and packaging capacity. We're now talking, think back at the chart we saw earlier about a lot of the fabrication and assembly test packaging is concentrated in Asia. We have less of it here in the U.S., far less than we actually need. And so at the same time, we have a shortage of manufacturing equipment and materials. So rare earth materials are becoming in short supply. Um, some of the manufacturing equipment for photolithography is also hard to get even for the older nodes. So we've got sort of at the macroscopic level, uh, it's not just the modern state of art, it's also legacy things that we're short on. Um, and not just not just the chips, but all the way back to that supply chain the equipment and the materials. Let's go to the next chart, chart 13. This sort of diagrammatically what you see in the automotive supply chain uh, semiconductor supply chain. The key thing here, and uh, my apologies for not including some definitions earlier, um, there's integrated device manufacturers. These are companies, much like Intel, has have, has foundry capacity as well as uh, they produce devices of their own design. Um, so what you've got is you've got on the left side foundry and OSAT capability, so that's the outsourced assembly and test is OSAT. You have pure play foundries like TSMC and Samsung, uh, the foundry piece. You also have the integrated device manufacturers. So those are people like Intel, uh, Renesis, Infineon. Uh, those tend to sit in, a, in sort of a, a bucket between the orange chevron and the red chevron there. Um, the key thing here is, um, there's been a trend in the the IDM manu uh, the integrated device manufacturers in the automotive industry to increase their use of outsourcing. So Renesis uses fab capacity, has moved some capacity to TSMC. It's just again when you think about lean, efficient supply chains, economically it just makes more sense for them. Same thing with Infineon. They're outsourcing a lot of their electronics elsewhere back into those foundry businesses. Even Intel has, uh, has outsourced some of their uh, chips out to TSMC. It's just economics and, and uh, capability-wise, it just made sense. Now, the large investment that we talked about, like the risk that was involved, has driven a lot of these companies to outsource more and more, so they become very specialized in their feet in their places. So that's kind of what this chart was intended to show: is that you have different companies working different parts of that supply chain. They're all very specialized. When you see the folks on the far the far right from the automotive business, those are all the car companies. They don't really do their own electronics. They might design some, but they tend to have their suppliers supply things. So let's go to the next chart. That would be chart 14. The key thing to note is, you know, going into um, on this chart into 2019, a 
lot of companies were already at 80% capacity and very quickly rose above that 80% capacity uh, threshold. And 80% was, has always been a sort of a long-term threshold that was considered full utilization. There's always going to be some downtime that it's hard to avoid. And what's that done, what that has hap what's happened through sort of 2019 2020, even before the pandemic, um, we had sort of a the increase in demand and factories weren't getting built very quickly. So the advanced nodes, which you see in that in this chart, um, is that TSMC, their five nanometer capacity is fully booked, as is their three nanometer capacity. So they basically gave priority to their large customers. So Apple did a deal, basically consuming most of their capacity. That did was put Qualcomm and NVIDIA and AMD possibly into a position where they might have to switch, might have to go over to Samsung, uh, unless TSMC uh, adds some capability. Uh, they do have a four nanometer line that I believe the other three might be starting to use. Um, and Samsung's capacity is, is at saturation. But this is before we actually noticed a lot of part shortages uh, in, in the marketplace we see today. And again, for the older nodes, there's been a lot of increased demand uh, over time on older nodes. Now that's the stuff that's 40 nanometer and larger. Oftentimes, uh, the, the wafers themselves are 200 millimeters, whereas the newer nodes are 300. So there's equipment differences there. So all the older node firms, they're working to increase their capacity, but what they're facing, what they're seeing is they can't get the equipment either brand new or, in many cases, uh, refurbished equipment that's uh, resold on the market as different foundries uh, shut down. And at the same time, they're finding some shortages in skilled labor. So the key thing here is you know, both commercial and DOD is going to need not only the TSMC 5 type capability or the Intel 18A that, that they're working to develop, but we're going to need the older nodes as well. Next chart, be chart 15. So here's a rough sequence of events. There's a lot more complexity than what this chart shows. What's going on? But when you look at before the COVID-19 pandemic, we had uh, U.S. trade sanctions against China. So, but that caused the Chinese companies to do Huawei, ZTE, the, the end producers of products. They started to stockpile 5G chips, meaning. Demand for, for those uh, high-end chips started to increase. The SMIC foundry became unavailable because of the trade sanctions. That was a, that's a Chinese foundry. They tend to operate at the, at the older nodes. So some of the equipment you see in automotive and medical was coming from SMIC. So that capacity was now taken off the table for a lot of U.S. and possibly European firms. At the same time, this 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 is an interesting piece of data. Between 2017 and 2021, the total production of cars in 2017 was 19, 95 million cars. 2021 was 75 million cars. The number of cars that got produced actually dropped. But the demand for chips went up from an automotive perspective. The number of chips per car nearly doubled. So the demand went up while the supply was going down. This well before COVID-19 hit. Um, and the reason is, is you know, more and more electronics are getting put into cars, not just the self-driving cars um, for vehicle control, but things like uh, entertainment systems, your dashboards, all that stuff has gotten more complex. Just your ability to connect your iPhone or your Android phone to your car and have it sort of, you know, the, I think they call it the uh, CarPlay, for Android, um, things like that have come into existence more recently. So once COVID-19 hit, we had a number of lockdowns, right? That drove towards telework, a lot of people working from home, uh, school shut down, so we had remote schooling. And that drove increased demand in consumer business, in business things for PCs, laptops. Uh, gaming platforms are already scarce, <laughs> got even scarcer. Um, and as a result of that lockdown, uh, people stopped buying cars for, for a little while. So there's a drop in car sales. So 
the automotive companies basically shut down uh, their chip orders, just simply quite a few of them canceled, and then started to burn the inventory they already had, just figuring that, gosh, this is going to last a really long time. And uh, so anywhere from six to 12 months after that, those lockdowns, after the drop in car sales, um, the auto market started to recover. Right? So before the auto market started to recover, the chip market makers had already shifted their business. So they went to those long, stable orders like we talked about, like, like Apple, NVIDIA, Qualcomm. They're doing more consumer business type stuff. Um, and so they shifted away from the automotive markets into the longer term orders. Some companies that were more in the legacy nodes, uh, they either had to really scale back capacity or they simply shut down and some of them went bankrupt. Now, all at the same time, what was happening is there's a number of just uh, disasters in Japan. A combination of earthquakes, fires uh, in Texas, there was a shutdown due to winter storms and power outages, also, also fires. Um, that sort of disrupted different supply chains in different ways. And it turns out you know, there's a, in fact, called the bullwhip effect in supply chains, uh, where the demand side for supply chains that are extremely lean and, and tightly wound, if there's a fluctuation in demand. Uh, what happens is it back propagates through the supply chain and the fluctuations increase as it goes backwards through the supply chain. People are anticipating or over anticipating what might happen or overcompensating. So, as these automakers sort of cut their orders and the consumer demand picked up, the chip makers had to, you know, had to forecast that uh, with a lot of uncertain information. So, what happened after the auto market rebounded is the automakers rushed to fill orders. Boundary capacity simply wasn't there for them. Same time, the overall demand did increase. So we're actually at a place where we have less capacity globally than we need. We have disruptions and risks in the supply chain itself because of the global nature. Um, and each each nation, each region is now figure, trying to figure out how to uh, how to get a little more complete supply chain that's more local, that's more more, more robust. The other thing to note is that. Right when COVID-19 hit, just before that, the cost to ship a container with a primary mode for shipping things, for moving things from uh, continent to continent, was about $1,500 per container, for a 40-foot container. And what you see today, uh, or at least uh, you know, towards the end of the, re uh, the COVID uh, lockdowns, is the cost to ship a 40-foot container went up to $17,000. When shipping costs goes up, uh, that, that impacted the supply chain and, and certainly the, the costs associated with it. So a lot of complex things that have happened uh, that have merged basically to uh, cause what you see today. Let's go to the next chart. This would be chart 16. I think this is my final chart. Um, one of the things that I was asked to talk about was what the government is doing about it. And I, I think a better answer is what the government and the industry together are trying to do. Uh, what you see here is just pictorially uh, the USICA, uh, so the CHIPS Act type bills that are going, have gone through Congress and the Senate. Uh, they've allocated a, a fairly significant increase for the research budget within National Science Foundation. So you've got across a five year period over $80 billion to develop the science underlying some of these things. So hopefully that will help pay, uh, pay off, will pay off for us in a few years. Um, we've got the CHIPS Act itself. The Department of Commerce is looking to uh, subsidize or incentivize companies to build more plants, at least here in the U.S. Uh, so they've got roughly $49 billion out of the roughly, uh, roughly 52 or so. Um, DOD's got $2 billion and Department of State has $1 billion. A lot of that has been focused on our state of art capabilities as people look forward. Um, there's a good deal of discussion going on of uh, where to put the money and how to, how to serve the, all the different aspects of, uh, of semiconductor fabrication capabilities that we're going to need going forward. Um, so 
nutshell, that's what's going on. In addition to that, because of those incentives, we've got existing commercial investments that are two, three, four, five times as large that you, you, you read about TSMC, you read about Samsung from a corporate perspective, they need to diversify their risk uh, geographically. Uh, this is independent of nation states. This is more just good business for them. Um, so they're, they're, they've announced they're building plants in, uh, in the U.S. Um, there are older node firms that also would like to build additional capability. Uh, unfortunately, as you saw earlier, that's going to take a few years, up to five, to put that uh, capability online. So that was basically the end of my talk. So I think uh, we could probably entertain questions if, uh, if any would come in. All right, very good. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, we, we've already got some questions, so let me start right off. Um, here's a question about uh, what role will artificial intelligence have in the future of the microelectronics supply chain security? That's if <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, yeah. A lot of it depends on how you define artificial intelligence, right? Um, I've been around that community uh, since 1970-something. So the, the definition of AI has changed over the years. The more recent definition is machine learning, pattern recognition type of things using very large amounts of data. So when you look at uh, the security of a foundry, right, right now, we've got a lot of manually collected data uh, that's easy to automate, right? So we can collect large amounts of data. And the real question is, is it going to be more heuristics? Is it going to be more uh, just raw, you know, brute force statistical analysis? Or is it going to be some more modernized sort of AI type of thing that, um, that do that pattern recognition within a foundry? So much of what we want to do is be able to look at a semiconductor fabrication capability and based on the, the easy to measure, cheap to measure data, um, identify if a process is consistent, right, with what you, what we as a customer might want to, uh, want to believe. Because uh, every one of these foundries is constantly tweaking their process to improve yield, improve performance, things like that for their commercial sector business. And commercial sector companies oftentimes instrument their chips to, uh, to have a measurement of that, but if they're able to get access to foundry data as well uh, with reasonable uh, protections, then we can do more analysis. So there may be a good amount of analysis that's, uh, that's possible uh, to start to instrument the supply chain and understand where there may be, uh, where may, where there may be deviations from the process. Very good. Thank you. All right, now we have a question. Do we risk reinforcing an oligopoly in the U.S. semiconductor industry if all of the chips funding goes to industry incumbents? Or how can we support more small businesses to build up the capabilities that we need to compete globally? That, that is certainly a risk. Um, when you look at the way the semiconductor supply chain fragmented, right, uh, into very specialized uh, pieces in the supply chain, right? Once upon a time, and I'm going to talk foundries, but uh, the supply chain is much broader, broader than the foundry, right? So once upon a time, uh, you know, growing up, let's say, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you found companies like Intel, Advanced Micro Devices, uh, there was Cypress Semiconductor at one point, there's a number of companies that not only did their own designs, but they also did their own uh, fabrication. And the economics of building a large foundry, as you go to more and more advanced nodes, it's simply not affordable to, uh, to operate your own foundry unless you have incredible volume. So what you saw is an aggregation of uh, foundry capabilities. That's why you see TSMC in, uh, today as a pure play standalone foundry. We now have fabulous semiconductor firms. So a lot of startups in Silicon Valley. I mean, that's that's where I live. 
been around them for quite a while. Um, they're fabulous. So they simply do the design and then outsource things to a Samsung or a TSMC or other foundry that's out there. We have global foundries here in the U.S. We have, uh, we have Skywater. We've got Tower that's been bought by Intel, a microchip. There's a number of companies like that. And the oligopoly, uh, let's say for five and five nanometer and below, might be a handful of firms. It might be TSMC, Samsung, and Intel, right? They're the ones that are big enough to play. <clears throat> and the more of them there are, the less volume each gets if they start to divide the market. And if they get less volume, and less capacity is incredible, then each of, them, each of them becomes less profitable. So there's a need to do some aggregation from a volume production capability. When you get to the older nodes, they, uh, they may end up having, assuming there's sufficient volume, that may not be compatible with Intel's or TSMC's or Samsung's capabilities. They may not produce to that feature size. It may not make sense for them. So there's be, so um, that, that's one aspect of it. Um, much of the innovation uh, around electronics will be at the physical layer, right? That's the how do I build a better fab. Uh, we do have, at least within the DOD, some efforts to figure out how to do equipment, manufacturing equipment that might enable lower volume, high mix type capabilities. That's certainly, there will be, there will be unserved markets um, if we have that kind of oligopoly focusing on the very large markets. So there'll be a need for that. We do need to encourage that um, because I, I think the, the the demand for some of these lower volume things will, will always persist um, until we get to some very common electronics. But as you saw, very, very many different types of electronics out there, each requiring a different manufacturing capability. So there'll, there'll be a trend towards aggregation based on volume, but we do need to improve that competitiveness. But a small company trying to get into a, a, a three nanometer capability from a manufacturing perspective May, uh, may not make sense without a lot of capital. So that means it'll be a small company with a rather large uh, private equity backing. Uh, I'm not, not sure the risk is worthwhile for the investors at that point. Uh, so, and, and speaking of the oligopoly and the large manufacturers, here's a question um, uh, uh, relevant to that. And if China were to invade Taiwan, would America somehow scuttle TSMC? I, scuttle is in quotes from the questioner. I assume that means take out TSMC or in some way disable it. And if that happened, would this substantially slow the development of computing power? Uh, and for how long? I, uh, you're asking me a question <laughs> that I can't answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. What the U.S. might do, that, that's a question for uh, you know, folks in the uh, State Department, uh, White House, and uh, DOD. Uh, how you scuttle a company, uh, that's another open question. Yeah. Um, you know, so it would certainly be a big disruption to our supply chain. We would have to take some measures. Um, there may be some companies that decide, you know, from a risk perspective that they need to move uh, to a different foundry capability, right? But what you're starting to see is TSMC as a corporation already announced that they will invest in building a five nanometer plant in Arizona. They also announced a, a, a relationship with the uh, Indian government under Prime Minister Modi uh, to build a five nanometer plant in India. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if more of these companies from a corporate perspective decided to geographically diversify. Uh, that, that's certainly, you know, that's out in the news. Um, what additional things a nation or a set of nations might do, I, I think that, that's not something I can answer. Yeah, no, un understood. Out outside of the scope of the briefing. But, but speaking of which, uh, we have a question that starts out with a comment, superb brief, which I fully agree with, and then asks, concerning the trusted foundry issue, the DOD is equally challenged with being a minimal competitor in the world marketplace while heavily impacted by trusted chip supply chains. How do you see the DoD working through this issue as the macro marketplace will always drive foundries trusted work? I think a lot of it depends on, uh, I mean, you look at trusted foundries, 
we've got things that are certified as trusted um, today. They tend to be older nodes. Um, there's quite a few, you know, even Global Foundries is working toward their smaller nodes towards a trusted type certification, at least not necessarily the certification itself, but actually doing all the things we need. Right? The fundamental issue with trusted foundry, and I put trusted foundry in quotes, is it implies a binary decision. Right? So if I'm the user of a foundry or user of a supply chain, so you really need, we really need to broaden it out to a trusted flow, right? Because the biggest risk is not in, you know, from if I'm worried about an adversary denying me capability, meaning shutting down my fab in some way to me, then the availability issue um, is, a, is a rather large one. And, and then geographic proximity is why we worry about Taiwan being close to TSMC being close to China, right? We're worried about invasion. We're worried about um, other things that might go on. Um, that's why we would like to have foundries closer to home, right? We can protect right. them, or we just have allies that we deal with. Um, the other aspect of trust is, do I know that the part that I'm receiving is bona fide or of the high quality that I expect? And it's very hard to disrupt a particular set of wafers within a foundry without, you know, again, this, it depends on the data you collect, uh, without somebody noticing. It tends to impact yields, it tends to impact performance, and it might actually disrupt uh, the entire product line that's going through that foundry. So very hard. Much easier to attack things like printed circuit boards. Really easy to attack the printed circuit boards uh, for, if I'm an adversary from a trust perspective, an insurance perspective. Also very easy to uh, attack the part where you're dicing, packaging, and assembling. We actually need better trust across the board, but again, a yes/no evaluation um, tends to be very dependent on you know set of experts, and oftentimes when you get a different set of experts, they'll give you a different evaluation. Um, so where we need to go is to be able to assess what risk level am I actually you know do, do I actually incur, and for my end application or for my mission. Um, if I incur a certain level of risk on that part, from a quality or performance or security perspective, it doesn't matter to my mission, right? So that, that I think we're still working through at, at, in the Department of Defense. Um, you know, what that next model looks like looks like, I think there's a fair bit of, you know, hopefully a fair bit of debate going on. But we need properties like if I'm a program manager uh, within a defense program or if I'm a product manager within a commercial company, I want to be able to compare my options, A, B, and C. I don't want to know that they're all trusted. I want to know which one's better in terms of trust. And uh, there's a whole lot of other properties that go with that that I don't believe we've had the full debate yet, but I think we're starting to. So I think that's probably about the best way I can answer the, uh, the trusted foundry question. All right. Sounds good. Um, here's a question about building factories. So the, 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 our, our audience member asks, if we cannot build all the factories that we would need to compete across the board in semiconductors, are there other hardware or physical components that we can dominate that would allow us to have competitive edge? And the questioner goes on to say, in other words, if we can't take back wafer fabrication, can we control another part of the supply chain besides, besides design? And if so, would it be worth it? Well, we do control a lot of the supply chain. Design is a big element. In fact, much of the innovation you see in Silicon Valley um, is the piece that people focus on you know, with, with foundry stuff. A lot of the startups we were talking about are doing incredible things. And so one thing you can do, and uh, we, we talk a lot about this within at least the Department of Air Force, is uh, what can you do with the existing capabilities you have? So if I don't have five nanometer, going from seven nanometer down to five nanometer, I get a roughly two X to three X improvement in performance per watt of power consumed. If you look at what Google did with their uh, 
TensorFlow chip, I forget, the, the TPU chip, Tensor Processing Unit, and you look at what YouTube did with uh, their video encoder chips, um, they're able to get 20 to 30 or 20 to 40x performance improvement, performance per watt, by simply designing the hardware in really smart ways. So it's the IP, uh, the design, the architecture, and doing the software in a really smart way, they've gotten 20x to 40x improvement in performance for a while. And they're not the only example, right? Um, you, you've got a number of other companies in Silicon Valley that are doing amazing things in reducing size, weight, and power and improving performance at the same time. Quite a few of them um, are opting to tape out at 12 nanometer as opposed to seven. Their volumes are lower, it's just cheaper to go to 12, and they, get, they still get performance improvements. In fact, I've got a colleague who has a startup where he takes out 12 and his chip compared to a data center chip uh, that's been developed at, I think, seven or five, uh, still outperforms the seven or five nanometer chip. So there's things that we can do to be more clever. Um, also, we don't need to own the entire supply chain, right? So if you take a look at critical infrastructure where we really, really need to have some assurance that we can trust the electronics. So critical infrastructure not being just the DOD systems, but uh, things that underlie our communication systems, uh, underlie our utilities, things like that, where we want high assurance that a bad guy is not going to uh, you know, give us the, a Trojan horse. Um, that's probably about 30% of the market, maybe 20 to 35%. If we get that much capability, we're in pretty good shape. After that, it becomes a, you know, economics issue of uh, where things are located, and if the supply chain is sufficiently diversified, we can't realistically expect it to be all in the U.S. when it's a lot of it's elsewhere. Um, but certainly, if it's within a Five Eyes type nation, um, or even just south of us into Mexico or up in the north of Canada, that might be okay. But uh, we kind of have to leave out all the options on the table. I, I think a lot of this is probably getting discussed and debated at a wide scale. At least I'm hoping it is. Very good. Um, next question. Um, a questioner points out that neon gas shortages have impacted some production levels due to its provenance from Ukraine and Russia. Are there other similar single source input commodities that we should be watching or concerned about over the next few years? I would say there's quite a few, right? There's been very little discussion of rare earths. Uh, you, know, you look at a place like Greenland, well, actually, rare earths are everywhere. So you have to figure out how to... Yeah, they're not very rare. Yeah. They're not very rare. But you, have, you know, the, the part is, you know, processing them into something that's usable is kind of not a very green process. It's very, you know, very uh, intrusive to the environment. So certainly, all the rare earth materials, we've got to get access. Mining, right? We have to figure out how to uh, process them in a fairly clean way. Um, you know, you have rare earth deposits kind of in a lot of places in the U.S., up in Canada. Greenland has immense deposits. But when you get to foreign countries, you know, we, we've got to take care of uh, their concerns as well. So we, may, we may need to uh, think about that. Um, Especially gases, uh, as you kind of pointed out, but that's certainly a big area. Uh, the interesting one, uh, based on Ukraine, is a number of auto companies face shortages um, in their ability to produce cars because cable harness, really cheap, low-tech stuff, a large number of the cable harnesses for cars were being manufactured in Ukraine. So I think you kind of have to step back and, and uh, look at the overall supply chain and and do a sort of a, a brittleness analysis. Say, where do we need to beat things up? It's not just in one or two places. I think you need to take a fairly holistic look. I think we're just starting to really grasp how complex this is. Right. Uh, at a wider level outside of those industries. Um, here's a question from a, from a listener, from one of our audience members, who's reflecting on a recent news story that said that various actions have spurred China to accelerate their march toward microelectronic independence and dominance. Um, in addition to providing significant funding, China can direct companies on what technologies to produce 
or on or what suppliers to use, the, the benefits of central control, um, they're part, thereby coordinating the entire, uh, their entire industry in ways that other countries can. What can we do to better to compete, given that our industry is driven almost entirely by delivering shareholder value? Well, yeah, <laughs> I think the, <clears throat> you're right. I mean, the shareholder value question is an interesting one. All of our companies are driven that way. But it gets down to how you look at shareholder value, right? Near term versus long term, right? So as I went through the charts, I kind of pointed out a lot of this was related to a lot of our shortages related to the over optimization of the supply chain, right? It was about near term profit. Um, and so five years ago, eight years ago, even three years ago, a lot of these companies because they weren't looking at the, weren't risk adjusting properly, right? If you, uh, even the investment bankers and private equity firms were like, they're quarter by quarter. That's the way our markets worked. Right? Um, I think the wiser firms tend to uh, tend to hedge bets. So it just may be more of a lesson to our, our investing community. That they've got to be a little more clever about this. Um, everybody assumed we'd have a very stable world for a long time, right? Um, so we've got a less stable world now. It's just it's a shock to the system. Now, where it goes, nobody knows. Um, but certainly the Chinese have a industrial policy that kind of drives um, drives certain parts of their internal uh, operations to consume Chinese source parts. And I th I think we have time for only one question. So let's. Let's let's go with this one. Um, the audience member asks: uh, Chips are only part of a printed circuit board. What plans are in place to shore up the printed circuit board fab capability in the U.S. and the domestic production of board materials? Is is that an issue of concern as well? It's a uh, incredibly large issue because we. You look at Apple, for instance. Um, a large number of their printed circuit boards uh, is manufactured in China. Part of that dynamic is because your typical U.S. company uh, could produce boards at roughly 50 micron feature size, and the Chinese companies were able to produce 25 micron feature size, which meant their boards were just smaller. And if I'm producing a cell phone, gosh, do I want that to, thing to be small? Now, with that said, uh, there are companies now that have developed processes allow an existing U.S. company that's operating at 50 microns to, without changing equipment, just slight change their chemical process, get down to, let's say, below 20. Or actually, I, I believe they did a run internal to one of the uh, DOD labs where they got down to 12 and a half. So, and they're, they're being good citizens, so they're, they're actually not licensing to any company that, uh, that is outsourcing, right? So um, that, that's there's stuff going on. Uh, we do need to sort of uh, support our um, assembly package and test, as well as our printed circuit boards locally here in the U.S. Very good, Yero. I I, I want to thank you again. Our 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 hour has drawn to a close, but thank you so much for a fascinating, comprehensive presentation. Uh, from the NDIA standpoint, this is exactly the sort of presentation we hope for from a, from one of our, our Technology Thursday series. Um, and I, I can see by the audience comments that, that our audience uh, 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 benefited significantly. So thank you so much. Let me also thank everyone for uh, our audience for attending, uh, especially for the great questions. We'll be posting the recording on NDIA Connect as soon as possible. Um, as always, if you have feedback about this series, especially if you want to suggest topics you would like us to cover in future episodes, please email us at eti at ndia.org. Um, if I can, let me also take the opportunity to highlight some upcoming events. Next workshop at our Enabling the Joint Warfighter series, focusing on contested logistics, will take place on July 14th. Uh, Understanding Appropriations for Critical Defense Technologies with Gobini will be on July 18th. And we'll be talking about Blockchain 101, our next Tech uh, Thursday series with Dr. Ian Taylor on July 21st. Registration information on all these will be on our website, 
or feel free to reach out directly to us again at ETI at NDIA.org. Thank you all for attending. Yari, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, everyone have a have a great rest of the day.